You're watching this video because you want to take photos of space like this, using only a tripod and a camera, which is gear you probably already have. Good, because we're going to dip our toes into the waters of astrophotography, and I'm going to tell you literally everything you need to know to take this photo, from shooting the photo itself all the way to the end of processing it. I've included timestamps of each section in the description so you can skip around after if you need to. Let's jump in. First, let's talk about gear. What camera and tripod do I recommend you use? You can really use any type of tripod you want. I recommend extending the legs as opposed to the center column. That way it's more stable. So don't do this, do this. Next is the camera, and you can use a DSLR or a mirrorless. You want to make sure it has a delay shutter release because you don't want to touch the camera while the photo is exposing. And lastly, you want to make sure it has a high ISO. Anything around 6400 is more than fine. In my case, I used the Rebel T6, which did surprisingly well for this project. And lastly, a telephoto lens. The key here is a low f-stop because we want our aperture to be as wide as possible. We also want to make sure it has a long focal length to capture detail in the nebula. The bottom line is kit lenses will work and you should use what you have. In my case, I used the Canon EF 75 to 300 mm telephoto lens. This is a lens that often comes as a promotional gift when you buy Canon cameras. Now this isn't a particularly fast lens and it's not a particularly expensive camera. In fact, I got the lens, the camera, as well as another lens off of Craigslist for around $200. Bottom line, if you have a digital camera and a telephoto lens, you probably have everything you need for this photo and you're good to go. Let's talk next about location and there's a few things you wanna consider. Firstly, you wanna make sure you have a clear view of the sky, unobstructed by buildings or trees. Specifically, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, look south, and if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, look north, because this is where the Orion Nebula will be. Secondly, you also wanna to try to avoid light pollution as much as possible. That being said, this is not necessary. In fact, the Orion Nebula is so bright, you could even take a photo of it from places like this. If you wanna see what light pollution looks like in your area, go to lightpollutionmap.info. I'll put a link in the description. It's basically a heat map of sky brightness across the entire world. The areas of red and pink are areas where it's brightest, or Bortle Class 8 and 9. And the areas where it's gray are skies that are darkest, or Bortle Class 1. You can go to the top left hand corner and enter in the address where you plan to shoot. Once you click on that address, the map will then zoom into that specific location. You can then left click on that location to see the Bortle Class rating. In this case, we can see the skies are going to be the darkest. Now to set your expectations, I actually shot this from my front yard, which is Bortle Class 6 skies, so it's not too, too dark. Now, you also want to avoid direct light pollution, so make sure you stay away from things like street lamps, or house lights, or even UFO lights, as all these can cause glares in your images. Street lamps are great 99% of the time, especially if you're a moth, Land. but for astrophotography, they're terrible. Land. As a final note, you also want to make sure you're allowed to be in that area after dusk, because A, many parks have rules, and B, there might actually be ghosts. Let's talk next about time, and when the best time of the year is to take this photo. If you're like most people, you probably feel regret the next morning after spending a late night, and you probably don't do too well. If that's you, then the best time is during the December to March time frame. That's because the Orion constellation will be highest in the sky earliest in the evening. That said, you can shoot this in the early evening hours of April, as well as the late evening hours of October and November. And it's great because you can see the Orion constellation from practically anywhere in the world. So whether you're tuning in from Switzerland or Australia, you can give this a go. You also want to try to take this photo as close to the new moon as possible. This is when the moon is the least illuminated by the sun. As it goes to its lunar phases, it becomes increasingly illuminated and then decreasingly illuminated. Now this is ideal, but not necessary. In fact, I actually shot this photo during an 87% illuminated moon, which looks something like this. Now while this can be done, as a general rule of thumb for astrophotography, you want to do your best to avoid the moon, so shoot during the new moon time. Moving right along. Let's talk next about camera settings, and if you're a photographer, you'll know the first thing is to change your camera to manual mode. This will give us greater control. You also want to make sure you change it to manual focus, because we're going to need to focus on the stars. Now chances are, many of these settings that I'm using will look like the ones that you're using, but you may have to adjust them. In my case, I'm using 1 second exposures, but you'll have to do some math to figure out what's best for you. Let me explain. 
As we know, the Earth is not stationary, but is tilted and rotates on its axis from the North Celestial Pole to the South Celestial Pole. Now, because the Earth rotates and because we are using a stationary tripod, we have to calculate how long we can set our exposures for so that the stars don't trail in our images. That's where the rule of 500 comes into play. There are two values to calculate the rule of 500 as it pertains to your particular camera and your particular lens. The first is called crop factor, and basically it's a way of comparing the sensor size in your camera to that of a full frame sensor camera. Because I'm using a crop frame sensor camera, my crop factor value is going to be greater than one. In my case, it's going to be 1.6. If you're not sure what yours is, go ahead and Google whatever model camera you're using plus crop factor, and you should get the answer. The second value is going to be the focal length of the lens we're using. In our case, we're using a 300 millimeter telephoto lens. So our second value is 300. We take the 1.6 from the crop factor, we multiply it by the 300 and we get 480. We then take the 500 and divide it by the 480 and we get a little bit over one. That's how many seconds we can set our exposures for so that the stars do not trail in our image. So you don't have to be an Einstein to apply this rule of 500 to your setup. It's always a good baseline and can help you get imaging faster. The next thing I'm going to do is change the ISO to 6400. Now I'm choosing 6400 because I'm actually shooting at f5.6. So I'm going to opt for a noisier image because I'm capturing less photons. Now if I had the luxury of shooting at say f2.8, I would back my ISO down to 3200 because I'm capturing more photons. It really depends on the setup you're using and you can play it by ear to figure out what's best. The next thing I want to do is add a two second delay because I don't want my hand to be on the camera while the photo is exposing. So I'll make sure I set two seconds, give myself plenty of time, and I'll be good to go. I also want to make sure I choose a daylight white balance. Now, chances are this will probably make your images lean to the warmer side and perhaps be a little bit orange, but that's okay because we're going to fix things in post-processing and get nice true colors. Lastly, make sure you shoot in raw and large JPEG, and this is really important. Shooting in JPEG actually compresses the data, which is a pretty scary thing. So we're going to shoot in RAW because these large files are actually going to be the ones that we're using for processing. The large JPEGs are going to be the ones that we reference when we're taking photos. So to recap, you're shooting a 1 second exposure at ISO 6400 with a 2 second delay using daylight white balance and shooting in RAW and large JPEG formats. You also want to make sure that if you're shooting with a newer camera like the T7i, to turn off any long exposure noise reduction. Finally, after all that effort, we can talk about shooting. Remember, you're going to look the direction opposite of the hemisphere you're in to see Orion. Orion's most easily identified by the three stars in Orion's belt, but we're actually interested in this star right here. And that star actually isn't a star, because that cheeky little speck is actually the Orion Nebula. Now, before you go and get all excited, stop. We need to focus, literally, because this is critical. The first part of focusing your camera is bringing Orion into view, with the lens zoomed all the way out. It should look something like this. We're going to use the star Rigel to focus because it's pretty bright. Go ahead and zoom all the way on Rigel and try to keep it centered as best as you can. It should look like something like this. Then use the digital zoom to zoom in the entire way. Notice that it's out of focus so you're going to focus your camera all the way to infinity. As we're doing this, it goes into focus but then it goes out again. It's almost focused but not quite. So we actually have to slightly back off the focus of infinity until it looks something like this. So ideally to get a good picture, you need to have your stars in focus and they should look something like this with the smallest white dot in the center and purple fringing is okay. It just means that you've got cheaper glass in your lens. Once you've achieved that focus, zoom out the lens and recenter your camera on the Orion Nebula. Be careful not to touch the focus and make sure you take your time. Remember, the Orion Nebula is right here. So once you have that in the center of your camera, go ahead and zoom the lens in all the way, making sure that you keep it centered. You can then use the digital zoom to zoom in the entire way and check. It should look something like this. So if you've reached this point here, then you're good to go. Stones. After that, back out of the digital zoom and give it a shot. And there it is, your first deep space image and it's a beauty. So go ahead, get excited, because you're gonna have to take 300 of these. So go ahead and click, and click, and click away.
Now, if you don't feel like sitting there and click, 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 clicking the shutter of your camera 300 times, you can get this nifty little device called an intervalometer. I'll put a link in the description of the ones I use. Basically, it's a device that plugs into the side of your camera and it activates the shutter for you automatically. Now, if you're using an intervalometer, make sure you set the exposure to bulb and also make sure that you turn off the delay because the intervalometer will take care of this for you. Using the intervalometer, I can set things like the delay until the session begins, the length of each exposure, the delay between exposures, as well as the number of exposures. Once I have all these fields set, I can go ahead and press start and I'm off to the races. One more thing, see how the Orion Nebula is drifting out of frame because of the rotation of the Earth? You're going to have to recenter every 10 to 15 exposures to try to keep it in the center of frame as best as possible. Now before you head over to processing, stop, because we are not done with the camera yet. We need that camera to take calibration frames, which is the next part of this tutorial. Now unfortunately technology is not perfect, and your camera and your lens are going to introduce their own noise into the final image, but don't worry, we have calibration frames, and even the Hubble Space Telescope uses these types of frames to get cleaner, better images of the deep sky objects. Now noise and artifacts can come from any number of sources. For instance, consider the noise that can... Oh, oh, there we go. The noise that can come from the sensor of your camera. Hot pixels can also create issues with your image. And you can also get vignetting from the telescope or the lens. And finally, there can even be pieces of dust that get stuck on the sensor or on the lens of the camera. So, how do we address this? Well, we take three types of calibration frames. The first are called dark frames, and they help us capture the thermal noise from the sensor. Next, we can take what are called flat frames, and these help us capture any vignetting or any dust that may be present. Finally, we can take what are called bias frames, and these help capture the sensor readout noise, which is specific to each camera. Take these right after you take the photos, and this is for two reasons. You want the dark frames to be taken at the same temperature as the photos, and you want to make sure you have the same focus for the calibration frames as you had for the photos. Now I shot these tutorial videos during the day, but you want to shoot your calibration frames at night so light doesn't creep into your sensor. Let's begin. First, dark frames. The first thing you do is put the lens cap of your camera back on. Then, turn off the delay because we can have our hand on the camera when we shoot. After that, go ahead and shoot. Take 50 of these dark frames, which are essentially the same settings as the photos, just with the lens cap on. Next, flat frames. You're going to need a white t-shirt or a white cloth, a rubber band, and a phone or a tablet with a screen large enough to cover the lens of your camera. First, you're going to remove the lens cap from your camera. Next, you'll change the mode from manual to aperture priority, or AV. Now that you've got your white t-shirt and your rubber band, you're going to take the camera and point it as straight up as you can. Make sure that you've secured it in place and that it's not going to move. Then take the white t-shirt and place it over the lens, being careful not to adjust the focus. Then stretch the rubber band over the lens and make sure the cloth is pulled tight. You want a nice even field. After that, you're going to take out your cell phone and turn on a white background. Turn the brightness all the way up on that device. Take that device and then place it on top of the camera lens. You're going to want to make sure that you cover the lens entirely with the phone screen because we want an evenly lit field. In the live view of your camera, it should look something like this, with the histogram 50% exposed. Go ahead and take a shot. As we'll see, the flat frame did its job because we captured a dust moat as well as some vignetting in the corners. Go ahead and take 30 of these flat frames. Finally, bias frames. First, you'll want to take off that white t-shirt. Wait, no! <sighs> you know what I mean. After the t-shirt's off, replace the lens cap. Then, set your camera back to manual mode, and you're going to select the shortest exposure possible. In my case, it's 1 over 4,000. Once you have that set, go ahead and shoot. Ideally, you should take about 50 of these. So to recap, first, you're going to take 50 dark frames with the same camera settings as the photos, the lens cap on, and shot in the same temperature. Then, you're going to take 30 flat frames, with the camera set to aperture priority and not changing any other settings. Make sure you use the t-shirt, rubber band, and phone or tablet to create an evenly lit field. Finally, you're going to take 50 bias frames, with the camera set back to manual mode, set to the shortest exposure possible, and with the lens cap on. In total, we should have 430 frames, and we can bump this number up if we want to increase the quality of our image, but I for one like my camera, and I don't want to kill the shutter. 
<laughs> Once you have all those photos on your SD card, we're going to create folders for each set of photos. And this is really important because it'll help us organize things later. So go ahead and create a folder for the light frames, the dark frames, the flat frames, and the bias frames. Now that we have our photos organized, we can move on to stacking. Well, stacking the photos, that is. In short, stacking is a way of combining multiple images into one final photo that we can edit. We use the stars in each photo as anchor points to align the photos properly. Stacking helps us get better images by averaging the photos. Noise, which is fairly random across photos, will be averaged out, and the signal, which is fairly consistent across photos, will become clearer. So by adding more photos to our final image, we can reduce the noise, and more importantly, increase what is called the signal to noise ratio. See, astrophotography is all about data, and at the end of the day, you wanna to try to dump as many photos into that final image as possible. This is going to get you better results. So, how do we do this? Deep Sky Stacker. I'll put a link in the description so you can download this. It helps us automate the stacking process, and it's free. When you open Deep Sky Stacker, it'll look like this. To upload the light frames, you go to the top left-hand corner and select here. Now, remember that we've already divided each of the frames into their own folders, and this is what makes our life much easier. Go ahead and go to the light frames folder. Remember, we're going to want to upload the raw files because it's the uncompressed data. Select the first photo, scroll all the way down to the bottom, hold down shift, click the last one, and then click open. Now, even though we've brought all these into Deep Sky Stacker, we need to still select each of these boxes to the left of these. So you can either go down manually and click one at a time, or you can select the first one, scroll all the way down to the bottom, hold down shift, select the bottom one, and then right click and select check. This will upload all of our 300 photos automatically, but we still need to do the calibration frames. So we'll do the same thing with the dark frames. Select dark frames, open the folder, select the first one, scroll all the way down, select all of them, and then open. Notice with these, however, we don't need to do the boxes, so we can go ahead and move on and do the same thing with the flat frames. Make sure they're all selected, and then open. Finally, we'll upload the bias frames at the last of our folders. Select the bias frames, select all of them, and then open. So now that we've uploaded all of our light frames, as well as all of our calibration frames, we need to next register the pictures. So select this button. There's going to be a value in the center of this box, and I'd change it to 95. This means that Deep Sky Stacker will keep the best 95% of the photos. Then go to Advanced, and we're going to select the Star Detection Threshold. Remember, the stars are anchor points as these photos are being stacked. In our case, we've got about 100, so that's pretty good. We'll then go to Recommended Settings down here and select this. And Deep Sky Stacker does this great thing where it will select in red the things that it would recommend changing. So click the blue underneath each of the red texts, and this will give you a great out-of-box solution for selecting the best settings for stacking these images. Once those are all checked, go ahead and click OK. We're going back to the menu we were at before, and we're going to click OK here again. This will bring us to the menu just before we stack. We've got all of our calibration frames, as well as our light frames, and the total amount of exposure time. Once you see the screen, go ahead and click OK. And we're off to the races. Now, this could take a few hours depending on your computer, so let's speed things up. I'd recommend doing this maybe while you're at work, or perhaps while you're at the gym, or maybe, my personal favorite, just before you go to bed, so that when you wake up, it's ready to go. Once you're done stacking your image, it won't be too impressive, and it'll probably look something like this. But don't worry, we're not gonna touch any of these adjustments down here, because we're going to be doing all of our processing in Photoshop, which is where we move next to processing, the best part of astrophotography. Like I said, we're gonna be using Photoshop, which is also free. Well, a free seven day trial at least. Once you have Photoshop opened, Go ahead and open the autosave.tiff file that Deep Sky Stacker has created. Again, it's not too impressive, and we actually need to change the bit mode so we can make adjustments. Go up to mode and select the 16-bit mode. After you've done that, go to the method and change this to exposure and gamma. Go ahead and click OK, and now we can make adjustments in Photoshop that we couldn't otherwise. 
The next thing we need to do is crop the image. And this is because black space can be difficult to process and can really skew the histogram of our image. So go ahead and pull these edges in to right about there and do the same thing with the top and bottom as well. Once you're done, click the check mark. We're gonna also rotate the image so we can see the detail closer. After you've done this, we can zoom in using the view or the control plus function. The next thing we need to do is create a new layer from that which is visible. You can do this by holding Control shift alt e on a Windows computer. This is a great rule of thumb to always protect your work and go back to an earlier version. The next thing we want to do is bring out this nebulosity here. So we'll adjust levels and you can do that by holding Control l We're going to pull this slider over here until it just meets the beginning and then we'll click OK. We're going to hit Control l again and we're going to move these two sliders so that they're closer to this histogram. So we'll bring this one in a little bit and then we'll bring the other one in just a little bit as well. You don't want to do too much at a time, so we're going to do this a few more times and a few more iterations to bring things in very carefully and slowly. Now you don't want to bring the slider too far in because you can clip the data. So make sure it's on the edge of the histogram and not cutting it off. Let's go ahead and do this one more time so that we can make sure we get as much detail out of this nebula as possible. Now we've created this nasty green haze, which we can fix by setting a neutral gray point. Hold Control L and then select the middle eyedropper. Find somewhere on the image where it'll be a black part of the sky and try to get it balanced. That looks pretty good. Once you've done that, you're gonna hit OK. And then again, like a good person, we're going to create a new layer from the visible. Once again, making sure we're keeping track of our work. Now the next thing we're gonna do is increase the vibrance and saturation of this photo. So go ahead and take the saturation slider and bring it up and do the same thing with a vibrance slider as well. Don't do it too much, but we do wanna to start to bring out some of this color. After you've done that, we're going to create two new layers from that which is visible. One of these layers which we'll continue to edit and the other one which we'll use later. Take the bottom layer and name it something special that you'll remember. Go back to the top layer and this time we're going to adjust the curves to bring out more detail. So hold down Control M and you'll have the histogram tool. Hold down Control again and click the eyedropper somewhere where the nebula is more faint. It'll plot that area on the histogram, which will represent the values of the pixels you clicked. Go ahead and pull that up slightly and we'll begin to see more detail of the nebula come out. Then go to the other side of the histogram and pull that down. This is called stretching the curves and it helps bring out detail in deep sky objects. After you've done that, go ahead and click OK. It's actually looking pretty good and we can see a lot of outer nebulosity down here. So like a good person, create a new layer from that which is visible. And the next thing we'll do is adjust the levels. So hold Control L and when the histogram pops up, move the slider to the right. This will make the overall image a little bit darker and make a little bit more contrasty. Click OK. And then the next thing we'll do is increase the vibrance and the saturation of the image once again. So go ahead and take the saturation slider as well as the vibrance slider and bring them up slightly to increase this color. And once again, we're gonna make sure we create a new layer from the visible to back up our workflow. Now notice we've got these nasty purple halos around these stars and there's a quick fix. Go to filter, camera raw filter, and then there's a window with a bunch of options that'll pop up. We want to make sure that we go down to the optics option and under that there will be a defringe tab. We're going to take the slider on the purple spectrum and we're going to pull it over to about two or three. And this will get rid of those nasty purple halos and bring out more of the natural reds and blues that are present. Now when we did that, we still got this nasty green color. So we're going to create a new layer from visible. And once we've done that, we're going to set a neutral gray point again. Click the middle eyedropper select somewhere on the image where it's good and nice and balanced, and that looks pretty good. So we'll click OK. Things are really coming along, but we still can do a little bit more. So we're going to once again adjust the curves to bring out some more nebulosity. Take the eyedropper, click on a faint part of the nebula, holding down the control button, and then pull that part of the histogram up while bringing the left part of it down. Again, we're bringing out more detail and things are looking pretty sharp and then we're going to do another levels adjust. So hold down Control L, take the middle slider and pull it slightly to the right. So we've got a darker sky, 
but a perhaps sharper nebula. Now notice we've blown out the center of the nebula a little bit, which is a little problematic. So we're going to take that layer that we had saved earlier and slide it up until it's just underneath. Then click that top layer again, go over to the eraser tool, and we're gonna make sure that we've got eraser settings set to about 2% hardness, a small size, and then a small percentage of opacity. Once we have this setting selected, we're actually going to zoom in on the center part of the nebula, which is called the trapezium, and we're gonna erase away the top layer. This will reveal the layer underneath that is less blown out and will provide us with more detail in the final image. You wanna take a smaller, lighter approach to this, and you don't wanna to be too heavy handed because you wanna make the blending look natural and you want there to be a smooth transition between layers. You can see that we're starting to actually reveal some of this detail and we're creating what's called a high dynamic range image. This will create more detail in the final image and will give us a cooler view into the trapezium, which is essentially the center of this star nursery 1300 light years away. Things are looking pretty good right now and I'm pretty happy with how this is coming out. So we're gonna zoom back out and that looks pretty good. So we're going to create a new layer from that which is visible and there's this nasty reddish glow to this image. So we're actually gonna adjust the levels again and we're gonna to go to just the red channel. We're gonna take that slider and move it over just a hair so that it's more balanced of an image. Once you've done that, go ahead and click OK. Now, things are looking much better than they were before, but there's still a lot of noise in this image. So to reduce the noise in the image, we're actually gonna go up to Filter, Noise, and then Reduce Noise. You can change these settings and adjust them to the ones that you think will be best. I find that middle of the road tends to be a pretty good solution, but again, I'd recommend playing around with them to figure out what works for you best. Once you click OK, you can begin to see that we have in fact reduced a decent amount of noise in the image. After doing this, what we're going to do is do one more curves adjustment, so Control M, and then we're going to once again Control click on a faint part of the nebula and pull that up just slightly and then go to the bottom part of the histogram and pull that down just slightly. You don't want to do too much, and again, you don't want to blow out the center because we've already fixed that, but do it just subtly. And we're going to once again increase the saturation just ever so slightly to give it that final punch. And you're all done. You've successfully captured M42, or the Orion Nebula, M43, as well as a part of the Running Man Nebula, which is pretty awesome. So, You've made it the entire way through this video and you've earned your ticket to join the astrophotography hype train. The question is, will you? Thank you so much again for taking the time to watch this entire video. I really appreciate it. And I hope you learned a little bit more about this crazy hobby we call astrophotography. I'm gonna be doing more start to finish videos like this where I show you how to use simple camera gear like the Nifty 50 lens, that's a teaser, to take these photos of space. I'm also working on a few other shorter videos, all things astrophotography, including astrophotography tips, as well as some of the stories behind the images I've taken. I hope you grow to appreciate this hobby and God's creation as much as I do, and I hope you stay tuned for those videos. So again, thanks for watching. Until next time, keep your head up, clear skies are on the way.